Hey, this is Matt once again. What about the videos? Another paid request. This time for Julio. Thank you so much for that. For those interested in requesting any type of commentaries, reactions, reviews, re review, randomness, a topic, a, a rant, whatever it may be, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. Usually, PayPal is the best bet, but those links are down below. And Julio wanted me to do a commentary on the 1991 film, Nothing But Trouble. And this will be an interesting one, because it's been a while since I've seen this, but... I have a pause at the beginning. 3, 2, 1, pressing play. We got the Warner Bros. logo. As, oh, the good life is playing... Warner Bros. load was ready to fade about now. And we're on the city steep. There's the Twin Towers. Now, nothing but trouble. Got Chevy Chase, Demi Moore, Dan Aykroyd, John Tandy. A pretty solid cast. Dan Aykroyd directed the film. For what I understand, he wasn't originally intended to direct the film. He didn't even really want to direct the film, but... Kind of one of those things that just had to be done. Apparently the idea was that him, his brother, and another guy had seen a horror film like Hellraiser or something like that. And he, they saw that the audience was laughing a bit. Now Brad, I don't know why an audience would laugh at Hellraiser. That was Hellraiser 6 or 7, okay. But Hellraiser 1, I don't know. Maybe it was a audience that was on some of the marijuana. Telenigron... I remember him from the last Boy Scout at the very end when uh, his death scene and then Bruce Willis does his dance. Uh, Sally Taylor, he's passed away. But uh, apparently after seeing that and seeing the audience reaction, it's like, hey, maybe one day we should do a horror comedy. And then ultimately that became this. Now, this film, when it came out, it got a decent sized budget, 40, 45 million, give or take. It was a complete utter bomb, and critics hated it. They called it one of the worst films of the 90s, one of the worst films of the year, abysmal, grotesque, unfunny. Dean Cundy did the director of photography. He did. He is. Dean Cundy did... Uh, Cinematography worked for John Carpenter a lot, The Thing, Steve from New York. Um, he worked with you know, Robert Zemeckis. Like Dean Gundy's been around. There's Chevy Chase. I've always enjoyed this film. I always thought this film was fun. It was quirky. It was weird. I thought the cast did a good job. There are moments that still make me chuckle, and I loved that sort of. Again, it's like Chevy and Dan in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 kind of movie, just you know, without the, the gore. But again, just this weird, quirky... I love that... That, tri that melding of both worlds. It's unexpected, and it's strange, and it's unique. <laughs> but apparently a lot of people just did not like it at all. I've always enjoyed it, though. Uh, there's Taylor, and he was the bad guy in The Last Boy Scout with Bruce Willis, among other stuff. And here we're going to get the beautiful Demi Moore. Always been a fan of hers. One of my favorite actresses. Probably would be in my top five in the midst of Sandra Bullock, Sigourney Weaver, you know, other stuff, other actresses. Because I just really liked her personality. I liked her acting in films like G.I. Jane. Even you know, I think she did a good job in this movie. Uh, Disclosure. Ghost. I always thought that you know she could be emotional. Like she did a good job in Ghost. But she could be very strong in G.I. Jane. But she felt real in, in those scenes. And this is 
try to be a bit more comedic role. And I thought she worked well with Chevy. She could keep up with Chevy's pace. I know Chevy's not really known as the nicest guy to work with, or depending on who he works with, they you know at times he could be difficult. Probably one of the reasons why his career kind of fell through. Because here's the thing, Chevy, he was a big star in the 80s where you had films like Caddyshack, National Lampoon's Va uh, Vacation and Chris's Vacation, Fletch. He had some pretty successful films. Even Spies Like Us made some money. But when he got in the 90s, things just took a turn where he couldn't find a hit. I mean, especially when he starred in it. Nothing but trouble. This was a big bomb. He was in, what was it, uh, Vegas Vacation, which I liked, but it, you know it didn't make a whole lot of money. Memoirs of Invisible Man was right after this film. That film bombed. Uh, he was in a film Cops and Robbersons with Jack Palance. Again, another film I don't mind as a time waster. I was I like this film more. Uh, but that film bombed. I mean, the closest he got to the hit was probably Man of the House with Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Because I think that doubled his budget. I think it cost like 20 and made like 40 million, give or take. Like the clo I mean, and probably a little bit later being in big parts in films like Snow Dogs. No, uh, not Dogs. Uh, Snow Day. I think it was Snow Day he was in. Snow Dogs, that's another actor. But Snow Day. He had a big part in that. And, you know, other than being in films like, was it Funny Money as a star? He didn't really get the star in a whole lot of stuff. I mean, he was on a TV show, a certain TV show that it seemed like most of the cast hated him on. I forget the name. It's a, it's a successful TV show, and I already forgot the name of it, but <laughs> it's a show that apparently a lot of people hated him on because he was terrible to work with. Or he would have bit parts. He had a bit part in the Vacation Reboot. He had bit parts in Hot Tub Time Machine 1 and 2. He had a bit part in this Paul Hogan movie. Like Paul Hogan from Cardo Dundee made a, a film. Or he was in a film. I forget what it was. A, a Mr. Dundee blah blah blah. It had nothing to do with Cardo Dundee. It was just Paul Hogan. I just playing himself. And Chevy Chase had a bit part in that. He just fell through because his films were not making money and people did not want to work with him because he thought he was a nasty guy. He was just temperamental or just whatever the case may be. <laughs> and yeah, his star just fell when he got into the 90s. And then Dan Aykroyd, I mean, you just say the same thing for him where... You know, before he was, you know, of course, Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2 and Blues Brothers and Spies Like Us with John, with uh, Chevy Chase. What was the movie? Uh, Trading Places with Eddie Murphy. He's been pretty successful. And the 90s were not great for him as well. I mean, other than if he was in bit parts, it worked a bit better. Casper, he had a cameo. Tommy Boy had a bit part, and those turned out decent and successful. Uh, I like Sneakers. I don't know if that did anything. He had a supporting role in that. My Girl was a hit. He had a supporting role in that movie. But you know, like when he got to like a bigger st stature in a film in the 90s, you had Loose Cannons that was a year before this. I enjoy that film. I think it's a lot of fun, but that film got hated on with him and Gene Hackman. People threw it in the trash and said it was trash, but again, I think... Uh, oh my God, I forgot. Loose Tannins. I think Loose Tannins is fun. I thought it was a fun movie. Gene Hack I thought Gene Hackman was a lot. Of, was pretty entertaining. I mean, sadly, Dan Aykroyd is probably the weakest part of that movie. Sometimes I do deal with him. Sometimes he's a bit much. I think when he's more low-key in that film, he's actually fairly good. And then when he's supposed to be crazy, he's going over the top. But I thought Gene Hackman really kept that film going and 
has a very unique plot dealing with a, a German porn film where this guy who's a Nazi and he's running for office and these uh, n Nazi folks are trying to... It's a very weird plot. Dom, Dom DeLuise is in it. I, I thought it was fun. But that film bombed. This film bombed. It was double because he directed it and he played a couple roles in it. Coneheads did not do well. People, I mean, people like the film and I don't mind the film. It's a cult film. But people forget Coneheads did not do well when it came out. Exit to Eden was embarrassing with him and Rosie O'Donnell where they go to the S&M Island. Uh, he was involved with North, which I know Roger Ebert called it one of the worst films ever. That's where he came with the, I hated, hated, hated this movie. And I don't blame him, because North is a god-awful film. Uh, Celtic Pride, with him and Daniel Stern, that was a big bomb. Getting Away with Murder, that's the one with him and Jack Lemmon, where he sees on TV that Jack Lemmon is this Nazi war criminal, and no one's going to give him his just dessert so Dan Aykroyd poisons him but then find out maybe Jack Lemmon wasn't that character he was someone else and yeah great plot for a comedy huh uh, he was in Sergeant Bilko that didn't do well I mean just it wasn't until like Gross Point Blank where again his bit role in Time and Born Gross Point Blank is like and again, Cameo and Casper, like those are like the big highlights for success. <laughs> Demi Moore at this time was rising star. I mean, Ghost was around this time. Then, of course, she was with Bruce Willis. I don't know if she was with Bruce Willis at this point. If not, then pretty soon. And of course, John Tandy. John Tandy. I, I grew up with him and miss the guy a lot. I love Summer Rental. That's a personal favorite of mine. Sally, no Blu-ray. John Tandy's passed away. The director, Carl Reiner's passed away. We can't get Summer Rental on Blu-ray. I mean, stuck on a out-of-print DVD. Well, actually, I don't know if it's out-of-print. I'm assuming it, but... Look at that old school... <laughs> You look at your car nowadays, much more te technologically advanced for that detail. But I mean, for 1991, I mean, it was what it was. But yeah, John Tandy is just, like I said, I love Summer Rental, love Planes, Trains, Automobiles, Uncle Buck is a fun one. passed away way too soon and you know, he was in Canadian Bacon which I think Dan Aykroyd was in that film too he was in like Canadian Bacon and Wagons East like just such a terrible group of movies I mean I would say Cool Runnings was a good one but see this one I'm talking about, I love sort of this weird quality of just like Chevy Chase Dan Aykroyd that type of comedy mixed in with this sort of weird Chainsaw Master type of temperamental temperamental mentality towards it just a very unique I always love this hey it's Evil Knievel Mr. Clean I remember that always even as a kid that always got me I did not go to a stop. One little bit of it caused everything. But they probably all this stuff they probably had to build and Of course when you get to the Vulcanvania and the mansion, all the topsy-turvy stuff in there the ends the owls it just 
it's unique. It is a very unique film. And I appreciate that. I remember it was advertised. Okay, for those take a trip back through time. There's a grocery store where I live called High V. It was like a chain for that area, High V grocery store. And that's where you could rent a lot of VHS tapes. It's a big grocery store and there's a big section for VHS tapes for people to rent. And there would be these pamphlets. You could pick up a pamphlet for free and it would show you all the movies coming out that that month I wish I kept these I wish in retrospect I would have collected them and kept them and it would be like a good little memento that collection and I remember seeing the cover for this a very unique cover where oh I recognize that guy from National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation the, okay I recognize him from Ghostbusters oh John Dandy you know Summer Rental and I said uh Planes, trains, automobiles. And my wow, it's like a horror film though too. And being a kid that grew up with horror, I'm like, okay, what is this? And it's just, and I said, it's very strange mix of genres that, for a lot of people, fell it in work. They felt it wasn't funny and all that stuff. But again, I I kind of. It's a pretty short film. It's only an hour and 30 some minutes. I do think Chevy Chase does a good job. I wish we could have seen more of John Candy as this character. But he has a double role where he plays the sister. And it's John Candy and Drag. Which I just, you know, Dan Aykroyd and them found it more funny than maybe some people in the audience. I mean, a person being in dread doesn't automatically create laughs with me. Now, if you make it work a bit with, uh, like, Robin Williams and Mrs. Doubtfire, like, there's a story, like, the story, the father wanted to be with his kids. Like, at least there's a bit more to it than that. And Robin Williams does a good job, and it doesn't just go to, he's in dread, so it's funny, ha ha ha. Like, there's a bit, little bit more to it. A bad side of that would be Big Mama's House. Which I'm not a fan of. Any of those movies. There's like three of them. It's crazy. We got like three Big Mama's House. But one Mrs. Doubtfire. Go figure. <laughs> what Chevy Chase did the, there. I have inadvertently replicated. Where. The two in the back are speaking another language. And Chevy Chase is just saying gibberish. Underlay, underlay, in the machine, in the machine, Will you shut up and let me drive? Now, that's not exactly what he says, but that kind of reaction, I have mimicked that a lot. Where any time I hear the accent, the language of the two in the back seat, I just instinctually think of Chevy Chase as like, like him and just get agitated. Underlay, underlay, in the machine, in the machine, just. I just like the way Chevy kind of rolled that off his tongue and his reaction to it. I think Chevy does a good job reacting to things in this movie. These peculiar, strange things. And, I mean, it's surprising that Shout Factory released this on Blu-ray. And it has features. Now, I watch this a bit with the... The audio lowered down a bit so YouTube doesn't get mad. But I remember watching this. It seemed like the audio was something felt off with it. I mean, it's not unlistenable and anything of the sort. But just something about it just sounded a little bit off. And I know there's other people that have said the same thing online. So I don't know if it's just on some, co some copies or what else is going on. Like I said, it's not unlistable or, or anything. It's just... Yeah, maybe it's just me and a few others. I don't know. 
But yeah, there are a few features. There's a commentary from a historian. Uh, I haven't listened to it in a long time, so I don't know the details. There's an audio interview. It's strange as an audio interview. I don't know why it's not an on-camera interview with these folks. I don't know why. But for some reason, it's just an audio interview. It's an audio interview with Chevy Chase, an audio interview with Dan Aykroyd, and uh, I think the the actress in the back seat with next to Taylor. I forget her name. Like it's crazy. There's any interviews at all, and it's weird that Chevy Chase. Like, his interview is strange because he kind of goes over the place. And he's been known to say that this is... He felt this is one of the worst films he's been in. He hated the film. So that's why I'm just perplexing that he would agree to an interview. Even if it's just audio. But he pretty much talked about... Worked with Dan Aykroyd and... Uh, he didn't really say liking or disliking the film, from what I remember. The actor tells a little bit about the idea for the film, how it was directing the film, and how he didn't really want to direct the film, and the 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 release being very subpar, and then kind of appreciating the fact that it seemed to get a little bit of a cult following. Of course, I mean, it seems like any movie gets a cult following, so it kind of makes it also makes you, well, what cultivates a cult following? Uh, maybe that's a term that gets overused a lot. This has a cult following, this has a cult following. Does it, though? Like, what truly necessitates something as a cult following? Like, Troll 2, I could see, because it got a documentary called Best Worst Movie Ever, and they actually detailed the fans of it. Bitch of Little China was a flop. You see that guy a cult following. Yes. This is where they bear a flipper. <laughs> Listen, this, this crazy architecture. And no cussing. Shit. <laughs> I thought that's kind of a nice shot at being reflected by the toasters. And also you have to be careful that you don't show the camera crew on the reflections. I didn't mean, just the idea of just like, okay, let's have a ton of these toasters just on the side here. And all of this... Is they'd be like one hell of an episode of hoarders. The hoarding all this crap. Like that's a pretty impressive set for all this stuff. So if you're wondering like where some of this money went to in this budget, it went to stuff like this. And then like that roller coaster where people get chewed up and bone spit out. I mean, it just... Doesn't I mean stuff like that. Just like, man, this is crazy. <laughs> Weird and crazy, man. Let's see if I can get some info on this on the phone. Vulcanvania. And also the inner workings of this place, too. Like the set dressing and the design, all the garbage on the stairs, these imposing angles of our possible soon to be victims. And you get little bits of this backstory of this judge and him maybe being screwed over in the past by. Bankers and assuming Chevy Chase is a banker, even though he's not a banker, he just keeps assuming because of 
his demeanor or the way he's dressed and everything in between that yeah he must be a banker that the bank what they seized money and they made this kind of this whole area like a cesspool and pretty much a dead town And then this crazy makeup that Dan Aykroyd has. I mean, it's like an almost relation to Chop Top from Chainsaw Massacre too. I see me like these, these weird pictures of. And what is that at the front? Like a mouse thing. Like at the bottom right of the screen, it's got mouse thing, hawk. I don't know what the hell that is. Bird? Yeah, and just he's assuming he's a banker. But no, he's not a banker. <clears throat> if you wonder what I'm doing, I'm trying to look up the info for this. Nothing but trouble. It's a 5 out of 10 on AMDB. It's a 12% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yep, that's where you do a bit more of that makeup. Like, come on. I mean, that truly is like, it'd be like Chop Top's, Bill Mosley Chop Top's uncle or something. I thought Dan Edward did a pretty good job. I mean, he's supposed to be this, this sick, crazy individual. His spontaneous <laughs> anger management, all that jazz. Put out that dog rocket. <laughs> so this is what the trivia says. Based on Dan Aykroyd's personal experiences as well as the stuff I said before. In 1978, he was pulled over for speeding in a town in the northeast in the U.S. Police officer took him to the local justice of the peace in the middle of the night for a trial. Chevy Chase did not like the script but took the leading role because he wanted to work with his friend Dan Aykroyd and thought they could improve the movie by improvising. Chase later said that Aykroyd took a huge career hit when the movie bombed because he had taken on so many roles, director, actor, producer, that no one else had a high enough profile to take blame for how bad things turned out. <clears throat> well, again, Chevy shouldn't talk because you look at what Chevy did afterward. I'm like, Chevy, you did Memories of Invisible Man. You did Cops and Robertsons and Funny Money, all that stuff. That's a little bit of a hint to what we'll see later on when he kind of turns and tries to help out uh, some of these other two folks. I yeah, I like the creativity. Like, what's <laughs> you pull on my coat now? Cool it. <laughs> I like Taylor. Yeah, I think the cast do a good job. They work well together. <laughs> Just complete exasperation. Oh, 
Oh, shut up. <laughs> now, that is one of the bald ones there, which I'm a bit surprised because... Like, he doesn't have, like, a big role in this. I mean, he's in it long enough to get killed. Is that Alec Baldwin? Is that Stephen Baldwin? Is it, uh... Daniel Baldwin? Yeah, I think it's Daniel Baldwin, the same guy who was in John Carpenter's Vampires. Because William Baldwin, he was doing films like Bat Draft. And what was that movie? Fair Game with Cindy, Craw Cindy Crawford. That was William Baldwin and Virus with Jamie Lee Curtis in 99. So that's William or Billy Billy Baldwin. Al Baldwin was doing films like The Hunt for Red October. So he, he was being the more successful one of the group. Stephen Baldwin was doing stuff like, well, later on he would do Biodome. So yeah, this is Daniel Baldwin. <clears throat> kind of the Baldwin you never really hear anything about. For better or worse. The true enjoy worked with John Tandy and Demi Moore, but Chevy Chase proved to be a nightmare. Chase was verbally abusive to everyone on set, tried to speak on Moore's behalf about her skimpy costume, and stated that he had more worth than Ackroyd because Chevy Chase had the bigger paycheck. The crew was furious at Chase's treatment of Ackroyd, with one crew member even threatening to drop a brick on Chase's head if Ares spoke to the director like that again. I mean, I can't confirm or deny that. When Dan Aykroyd was interviewed, the audio interview, he didn't say anything bad about Chevy. He said that he was, how did he word it? Not quirky, but like there's a certain way to deal with Chevy. So. But yeah, I've heard that a lot about Chevy Chase. That's a big fucking gun. Try to think what kind of weapon that I mean that kind of looks like I don't know submachine gun. <laughs> I'm not sure what the uh, kind of gun that is. Bertilla Damas Dama is the the lady who's interviewed on this as well, and she was with Taylor. The film was originally darker and a tad more graphic, but with Tess audiences reacted poorly, the film was re-edited and its release date was pushed back. Pressured, awkward, atone down the cartoonish violence to avoid an R rating, which in turn caused the release date to be pushed back from Christmas 1990 to February 1991. Ah, uh, here we get the, and them put to death. I mean, obviously humor is subjective, but I just don't see it that bad of a movie that... You know, it's like Roger Eber says, it's so bad, I didn't want to even want write a review for it. I'm like, dude, I think it's better than, you know, Top and a Half. I didn't hate Top and a Half, but I think it's better than that. Dan Aykroyd originally wanted to call the film Vulcanvania. Yeah, I love the design of this uh, roller coaster. And the idea of just having this thing that just strips all the flesh of your bones. And Obviously, th this result is done for comedic effect. Because if it was like a lot of blood, chunk of flesh, number one, it would not have maintained its PG-13. But I guess originally it was rated R, so who knows, maybe you would have seen a bit more of that. 
But I guess like stuff like this, like the audience, they think of Chevy Chase, and they think they're going to see you know National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, or they think they're going to see a Ghostbusters type of movie, and they see something this darker and this crazier, they just got pissed for some reason. Rip Moranis was the setting choice for the role if Chevy Chase turned it down. <laughs> that would have been interesting, Rip Moranis. Dad were offered the script to John Hughes. He was interested, but he turned it down because he only directed his own strips. John Landis disliked the script and immediately turned it down. Chevy Chase made fun of the film on the Chevy Chase show. Well, let me tell you something. This is a lot better than the Chevy Chase show. I'm sure most people are like, what the hell is the Chevy Chase? Chevy Chase shows, he tried to do a talk show, and it lasted about, I don't know, 17 minutes. The song that plays whenever Judge activates the tabletop train during the dinner scene is Wabash Cannonball, performed by Doc Watson. It was noticed on set that Chevy Chase was complaining about everything and doing the bare minimum of his performance. I mean, I think Chevy Chase doesn't do that bad of a job, but... I don't know. The Bone Stripper ride was a used roller coaster bought for $15,000 and redesigned for the movie to go out of the back of the mansion into the metal teeth of the Bone Stripper itself. Here it says at uh, one point it was re thought of for a Halloween 1990 release, which actually that would have been a better fit. The budget was spiraling out of control and the production head told Ackroyd to stop the bleeding. For example, lots of money was spent on toasters and broken down cars displayed around the Volkswagen mansion. The mansion itself was a 90 foot tall was 90 feet tall and the town of Voltevania was filmed at various sound stages of Warner Brothers. Let's see. Jeff Goldblum was offered the role of, of the lead, but the studio didn't think he was a bankable enough star at the time, refused to cast him. Yeah, and a few years later, he'd be in Inde <laughs> Jurassic Park and then Independence Day. So go figure. Apparently Demi Moore during Bright spent time alone in her trailer. See, this one I'm talking about, like, I love these ideas, like this weird, like, 
all these little props and stuff around this table and this train with all these condiments of ketchup and stuff. And of course, there's that bit where Chevy with the with the hot dog, this bratwurst that looks just disgusting and sick. And when he's trying to buy it, Chevy imagines like really like ideas to just mess with the audience, where you see the nose and the nose looks like you know an old dilapidated type of nose. But then Chevy literally at one point sees. The tip of a penis and like you see now and that's not what it is I mean it's disgusting but see there it is that's just his imagination of it but those little things are put in there and it's like you're like Chevy like what is that what the fuck I just saw <laughs> it's so weird Let's see. The film's release was delayed to recut the film for PG-13, removing the film's over-the-top violence. I mean, I'd be very curious to what that violence was. Uh, I was assumed during the bone stripper scene. Let's see. Sorry, I'm just looking through this. John Candy suggested to Dan Aykroyd that Meg Ryan be offered the role of Diane as he worked with her on Armed and Dangerous and enjoyed working with her. However, she signed a commitment to star in Oliver Stone's The Doors. Hmm. Critical reviews indicate that stars Chevy Chase, John Tan, and Demi Moore appeared to give much less anime performances in the movie than in their other films, and all three even looked embarrassed in certain scenes. I mean, I don't know about that. I mean... When you say animated, to me, they're being low-key because how the hell, else, like, to react to this crazy-ass stuff going on, like, how are you supposed to react? How are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to, like, they say low-key. I mean, when you're in this dire circumstance, you're not going to be up to, you know, oh, yeah, we're doing this. I mean... I think them playing a bit more serious actually makes it a little bit understandable. You get the reaction. You get how, why they're reacting this way. I think it comes across better, to be perfectly honest. Like Demi Moore, I would not say is low-T and not as animated. I don't know where that comes from. And Chevy Chase, I mean, was he really that, quote, animated in films like Caddyshack? I mean, Caddyshack, that was kind of his demeanor of na -na 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 -na. being kind of deadpan and saying his lines in that fashion. And like John Candy, like you look at the role he's playing, the role he's trying to portray. Did he want to be psychotic and over the top and yelling and screaming? Like, how did they want these terrors portrayed?
I don't know, fish tacos don't really sound that good, to be honest for me, but... <clears throat> I you know, I'm looking at these performances, and I just... I, you know, I don't really... I, if they were trying to be like bigger over the top, I might come off as more obnoxious and annoying. So I'm I'm fine with the and the acting never bothered me like it. I guess it did to a lot of critics and stuff. I mean, I wouldn't say Chevy. Maybe he was embarrassed to be in this, but I don't think he playing it like embarrassed I mean I think he does a bit better here than he does in Memoirs Invisible Man I think this is just kind of his demeanor and his way of acting in the 90s to be perfectly honest this is fish kiss just like fish kiss like It's like Joe Bob Burr's when he did his comedy. I hate fish kissing, just fish kissing. And that was the title, Nothing But Trouble. Then just this weird set design put everywhere. And just trying to figure out what the hell to do next. I was assuming this is like the, the characters are tied to the side in order to rotate and not fall off. Now, I'm thinking, are we to assume that this was maybe the other, like, the brother character, John Candy, that was looking on and let them out to see if, give him a chance to escape? But would he have gotten, been able to get into the damn house again? That's really, like, you just wonder, like, what the hell's going to happen next? Is like, these weird rooms and now a wall ready to crush them. And... So does that make you wonder, like, okay, so maybe it wasn't that John Candy. Maybe it was someone else releasing them just to get them to this notion to get killed. That's what I mean. As a kid watching, as kind of watch it. Seeing this weird horror comedy adventure, like all these different rooms and traps, and again, there's another trap there, almost getting crushed by a safe, and just wondering what the hell is going to happen next. I have funny enough, the same year, which I would say is, you know, I like more as a movie, uh, The People Under the Stairs, which is another crazy film with one set main well one setting where all these different traps and, and stuff happen in between but even then all the detail with all these different 
passports, auto club cards, driver's licenses. Like telling the whole story, like backstory of this. Plus of Hare Krishna's disappear. I, yeah, I like this. Like all of the like world building structure of this. Like Jimmy Hoffa. Like what Jimmy Hoffa, of course. Now you know what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> Criminals, creeps, and bankers. Wow, that's pretty animated there, that reaction <laughs> by Chevy. I mean, if you're in this dire circumstance, what do you want him? having one-liners every other like as if no i mean he's a bit more serious because the circumstance circumstance is a bit more dire so i yeah i, I just don't understand that complaint try to remember where the well i guess yeah chevy did have cigars his character that's what he smoked him before I will say Chevy Chase's haircut does make him look a bit older in this compared to just a few years ago in Christmas Vacation. So that's the the brother John Candy helping him out there. So maybe it was him like hoping that they would figure this out or I don't know how else he would know they were in the attic. That's for me. I just this it's like a adventure movie in a way with all this different stuff. I don't know. I, even as a kid, being a fan of adventure movies like *Raiders of the Lost Ark* and *The Goonies* and these type of inner workings and traps and hidden rooms, hidden doors, hidden slides here, just for some reason always fascinating me. Can't cry. <laughs> tell you why I mean they like why was the slide built in the first place who built the slide why did they build this slide in the first place <laughs> I like her you get down here right now I just don't see it so bad that it got so much animosity towards it. Now, are there ideas that I'm not big on? Sure, I, we'll get to that in a, a few minutes. But this is, a, I do like this, that this judge is kind of falling apart and you see a bit of it there. Taking pieces of himself off. You know, like pieces of his nose. Yeah. Like, that's pretty good makeup, I, I think. They, you know what? They kind of did this for what was that? There was a Tetsuya Chainsaw Master movie after this that did this bit. Was it the beginning? It might have been Tetsuya Chainsaw Master the beginning, the prequel to the 2003 movie, where there's a bit where Leatherface was like, kind of like that, and you see like a piece of his nose off, but it looked like they did a bit of CG work or something, and I'm like, it was done better here. Who's done better here? It was done practical. It looked like creepier. Like Skeletor's nose. And the nose nose. 
I mean, we didn't need to hear the guy fart. Like, come on now. Think we have the car, the Beamer, but not quite. All they that is used later to get the hell out of Dodge. Yeah, if they've been here since like the 1890s or so, they've. But it makes you wonder, like, where did all the toasters come from? Where did all the other stuff come from, and why are they there? It does make you think, like, why is all this stuff there? Like, why did they get all these toasters? Why do they have all this equipment? Don't quite know. These two guys, uh, I wouldn't say I'm big on these two creatures. I don't know what the hell you call them. They're just very. I mean, there's weird and there's like, what the fuck? These. I don't know what you call them. These two mutant baby adults wearing big old diapers and yeah, this weird whimsical, not whimsical, but this weird music behind it. I guess originally Dacro was not going to be one of these characters. Just, I mean, he was directing. He was already, you know, the judge. But I guess they couldn't find an actor. So then he portrayed that. I remember hearing or reading somewhere that at one point he was even the hospital because of stress and all the work. Like, yeah, you know, all this heavy makeup and directing a film and the budget going over. Just... I will admit, even though uh, these guys are, seem to be a bit much, I do laugh at certain things about it. Please, please. <laughs> I think just the, the insanity of, like, you see what's going on here. You have John Candy wearing a dress, mute. You have these two mutant babies. You got Demi Moore. You got Bobo and Little Double. I just. <laughs> I was just something about that line. We're not allowed in the house. <laughs> something about that doesn't make me laugh. It just. I keep repeating strange. It's just strange. But unique. Dare I say original. Which. God forbid we get some original movies nowadays. But, I mean, then you get films like this, and then you get completely punished for it. The grand original yells out to be good, and good is subjective, and a lot of people just didn't think the movie was good. Ah, uh, we're getting into the Digital Underground Band rap group. And one of these people... Happened to be Tupac Shakur, a very young Tupac. And of course, soon after would be his own star, to be honest. <laughs> I'm sorry, just one red nap, please, bitch, man. <laughs> I 
I didn't mean, is that every day you did I mean that was also kind of as a kid knowing about these actors following their careers as a kid as in you know seeing the National Lampoon Invitation movies knowing about you know Caddyshack and Ghostbusters and some of these other films and then you know seeing something like this where I guess for Dan the closest was either Twilight Zone the movie the bit he was in there or you know a uh, Ghosts with Casper and Ghostbusters, but like horror. <laughs> it, was also, it was also interesting to see these two guys again because, you know, well, they work together in Spies Like Us and in this, and a bit in Teddy Chat too, because I forget Dan Aykroyd was in Teddy Chat too. But now, you know, they're on opposite sides here. <laughs> I do think it's kind of a fun little fight here. <laughs> One of the things is, my stunk! <laughs> She's got your taint on her now. What a way of words. <laughs> Like the, I think the set and production design are pretty on point in this. Now Tupac, uh, he's he's in the back there. Uh, I'm trying to remember where he's at. There's a bit that pops up of just him on screen. I remember on the left on the far left on the white t-shirt I think in a way it didn't, what made John Candy work in this type of role was not having him talk as his character. If it was him trying to sound like this, and trying, I think that kind of would have made it a bit more annoying. <laughs> this is John Candy trying to do what he can with physical comedy. <laughs> I try to remember what I've seen that actress in, the one with the now with the was M sixteen, the the machine gun. <laughs> I 
I mean, they're trying to add through that big old fat of makeup, man. They're trying. This is a song that got stuck in my head for a while back in the day. You know, all around the world, same song. Been all around the sun, same song. There's Tupac Shakur with the New York Yankees uh, t-shirt. Uh, rest in peace to Tupac. Get my rocks on. Eat popcorn. Watch you move your body to the pop song that I'm singing. Dina lean funky beats reening. Yeah, I mean, a movie, it can be pretty sketchy when you have someone, like, do a full song for, what, one or two minutes. Uh, but at least this is a fun song. It's nostalgic as well. It definitely brings me back to seeing films like this in the 90s. I'm sure Digital Underground did the movie for... I'm sure they did because, hey, you know, it's Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase. It's going to be a big budget movie. We're going to be seen. If we're going to be seen and people don't hear our song, if people don't hear our song, then people will check out our records more. And you're not expecting, you know, the film will be a humongous bomb. And we see that the judge has a little bit of music. In his bones, one of the re well, the reason why he lets these guys go. I guess some people would say Chivy's face on there is why am I in this goddamn movie? The actor screwed me over. Now this song would appear again at the end credits of the film. Which I read somewhere that they weren't sure on how to end the film. Then they ended it with that kind of Looney Tunes going through the wall. Like the shape of Chevy Chase and some crew didn't like it. But it's like, well, this is all we got. I mean, who knows? Maybe they could have ended where I like that ending. Like I, I think it's very funny. Where see you see you, I see you soon, banker. And the way Chevy Chase goes, no, you won't. <laughs> that does make me laugh, and I do find it funny. But kind of, it does leave room for a sequel that never happened. Well, I do like that line delivery. No, you won't. I mean, I don't know. You could have had it where Chevy and Demi. They were in it. All he wants to do is get to Atlantic City, right? To get there with Demi Moore. So it could end with the judge and them die. They fall through the, the ground. Ch Chevy and them. Chevy and Demi are in Atlantic City. They're enjoying their time. And it could be. Remember the ending of Misery? Where James Conn thinks he sees Kathy Bates? But it's not, and someone goes, I'm your number one fan. Dak, I mean, uh, Chevy Chase could look and think he sees the judge. Freaks out, and he snaps out. It could be actually Dan Aykroyd. I don't know, it could be Dan Aykroyd playing a character, no makeup, going, Oh, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, man, you dropped this. Hey, I'm a, I'm a fan. You published this, right? Thorn Weekly? Oh, yeah, you know. Oh, it's nothing, nothing, nothing but trouble, man. <laughs> well, you don't have to say that line, but or, or something else. <laughs> Slip on a pud collar. That's probably the first time I've ever heard a condom referred to as a pud collar. I 
Then you get that wedding. Boom, doo, doo, doo. Na, 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 na. And we're, I mean, we're getting to the finale of film now that I see it. We're an hour and nine minutes in. Almost an hour and ten. We got 23 minutes. 23 minutes and that's with the end credits. So yeah, it doesn't, it's not that long at all. Now, I'm not going to say this is like the funniest comedy ever. It just, again. With the thing of Chevy Chase, like... If I had to be honest, this is one of the Chevy Chase films I grew up with more than the others. I would say, in all truthfulness, this one and National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation were the two Chevy films I knew as a kid. And so when I saw, oh, it's the guy from Christmas Vacation. Like, it wasn't until years later that I saw the first Vacation movie and, you know, Vegas Vacation, of course, other stuff. <clears throat> It was years later that I saw Fletch. It was years later that I saw Caddyshack. So I yeah, at this time I'm like, oh Chevy, the guy from you know, Chris Vitation or Nothing But Trouble. Oh, we're going to get his uh, drop into the bone stripper. That's right. That's coming up next. Let's seeing what it says here on Wikipedia. Ah, uh, stupid computer. Probably screwed up my audio. Thank you, computer, for telling me something that I've known about for years since I've had it. <laughs> I forget the, the bone stripper. What was the Oh damn Yankees, that's what it was. That's right, damn Yankees did the song for Bone Stripper. And yeah, I would be curious to see what the R-rated version of this film would have been. I yeah, I just I don't see like the the like these reviews are just so insanely harsh. I'm like I don't think the film was that bad. One of the legendary disasters of the movie business, a movie so unfunny, so distasteful, and so painful to watch that you can't take your eyes off it. The problem is that the director appears to believe that being gross in itself is enough. Even John Waters and Pink Flamingos period realized that wit also necessary. I'm sorry, I don't like Pink Flamingos. I like this film a lot more than Pink Flamingos. I'm sorry, you want to talk about gross and disgusting? That has a person literally eat dog poo. On camera, give me a break. Nothing in this movie is as gross as that. Nothing. 
Mean-spirited effort by Acro proves that he cannot write an effective comedy. If he's acting, he should leave the direction to someone else. Adding the pain and suffering of Notch's toxically unfunny bad taste is nothing but miserable. A grotesque comedy that is more likely to make audiences ill than make them laugh. A hideous, grotesque nightmare world nobody in their right mind would want to visit the first time, let alone return to. But Complex said, Complex says, Nothing But Trouble is one of the 25 underrated 90s comedies. A strangely magnetic clusterfuck of a high concept comedy. IFC listed Nothing But Trouble as one of 10 90s comedies that really need sequels. <laughs> this would never get one, but... I said, as I watch this again, I'm just befuddled by just, again, the animosity and the anger towards the boo, and I'm sitting there going, really? Like that? Pissed off about it? I, I just don't see it. I'm sorry, I just don't see it. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that was anim. You know, I think that's pretty animated. What Demi Moore was doing, run, run for your life, yeah. <clears throat> and people talk about how gross it is. I mean, you didn't even a shit ton. I mean, look at all the gross out comedies that have come out, like. The what was it? The Vacation reboot that Chevy Chase was in, where there's Chris Hemsworth's boner and a cow gets hit and explodes in gore, and there's something about Mary. A girl gets a fucking semen, a piece of semen in her hair that gets rolled up. A cum shot on the hair, type of joke. That's not gross. But this film is. I don't see any cum. What was that movie? The The Lighthouse? There's literally a scene where Willem Dafoe is jacking it, shoots his load, and is dripping and almost hitting Robert Panson in the face for some artistic measure. And that got praise up the ass. Oh, that isn't gross. That isn't, you know, grotesque. What? So many people are so full of shit, man. I guess, you know, if, if, if you shoot loads of cum on people's hair or almost on people's faces, that's okay, but... An over-the-top bone stripper where bones shoot out to a bullseye target. That's too gross. Got a little bit of explosion there. Probably the closest Chevy Chase ever came to being an action hero. <laughs> well, I mean, Fletch is a bit of a, more of a, you know, mystery Maybe a little bit of Fletch, but. <laughs> Even there's like a little bit of an action film here with this, the chase sequence. And big old explosions. The pyrotechnist had a field day there. Even this like Land of the Giants type of facade with all these Paul Bunyan wannabe motherfuckers.
Yeah, just the set design is really good. <clears throat> Not every Joe works. I mean, uh, was it less than a minute ago? Smells like San San Paulo. Now that joke either goes over my head because never been to San San Paulo. I know that was something that Taylor and the girl said much much earlier in the film, when right before uh, John Candy finds them and gets them out of there. I mean, maybe it would have been cool to see a little bit more, even more of an action-heavy finale where Demi Moore takes care of the that female cop, that girl there. Like, Demi Moore took care of her, and she knew a thing or two from being in the city. Chevy and Dak Roy get into this big funny fight back and forth until Chevy and Inverly or on purpose wins and throws the judge down a pit or something or did done in maybe a funnier way the two of them do something that makes the whole place blow up in this big explosion and they're running they get on the train and so maybe have them on the train and have the place blowing up behind them while they're riding the train. Because this is a bit weird where you find out everybody in the police department knows the judge and you know made this whole big deal with like a thousand of them helping bring these two back. And then just for the diddles, not the diddles, but just by fate, there's an earthquake or whatever, not earthquake, but whatever the hell, and brings everything down to the ground. It's just like, okay, I guess that's it. That guy I recognize in a lot of movies, the when I trust back, the guy in the middle. Yeah, that guy with the, was a pink shirt? He's been in a lot of stuff. It's all it's always that thing is oh that guy. I can't remember his name, but it's like each time it's like it's that guy. Yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember the movies, it's like I know I've seen him in a bunch of stuff. That guy was on the C B radio now. Now this is Brian Doyle Murray. I mean, this is related to Bill Murray. Yeah, there it is. Brian Doyle Murray. He was, what, the mayor in Groundhog Day. and He's another guy that you see pop up a lot. Of course, popped up in these, these about Bill Murray films because this is his brother, among other stuff. Like Brian Dole Murray is like in the opening credits his title card and he's in it for like I don't know a minute. <laughs> so I guess because of who he knows he was able to get up the ladder in terms of credits. <laughs> That's what I mean, like you know something's up because there's no reason why a cop why cops will let your two witnesses go up and knock on the door and none of this would make sense. I guess I mean this is meant to be the, the a twist.
But then it's just like by complete coincidence, this all comes about. It's like having two climaxes, one after the other. Like we just had the big, one, well, you know, semi big climax with explosions and our heroes run to the train and steeping. And then they get right back to this and then they have like another ending. So it's like. It's almost as if we had two endings in mind. We have the ending with them escaping on the train, and we have this ending here with everything. It's like, well, let's put them both in there. Maybe if you just somehow combine the two. Where again, like Chevy and Demi Moore, they cause some ruckus or they light some stuff on fire. And I did. It's like, okay, we we have them do this deep on the train or we have this happen they call for help help comes they think they're safe it's it's the uh, friends of the judge and then this that yeah it's kind of like they have two finales so that's why it comes off as a little bit weird it's like you have one or the other i uh, yeah it'd be nice if there's a way they cause this to happen instead of just random act of God, you know. I mean, they kind of explain, but still. It's like by luck that just happened so that Chevy and Demi didn't get killed. And... Dennis, played by John Tanny, definitely made out like a <laughs> made out like a beast. <clears throat> I do like this bit with with Chevy as well. <laughs> Obviously having nightmares of the judge. <laughs> I saw them involved with a dog as well. <clears throat> but I'm glad it wasn't like a downbeat. At least it does leave room for a sequel. Which is a little bit annoying, because of course none will come to be. But it does, I mean, at least elicit a laugh out of me with this reaction. Hey, you have the mine fire. Subterranean mine fire near the town of Vulcanvania. I wonder if that means with all that oil, that means he's rich. Well, he says, oh, no, at least we all got alive. <laughs> See you soon, banker. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> so, I, I still find that kind of funny. It's weird. I mean, it just... It's kind of like, just don't take this film that seriously. It's, a, it's not a film meant to be taken seriously. I like this too. They don't do this as often as they used to, where they have the person's face and then their name and who they played. Like each person gets their title credit. Like you saw at the end of Predator and, and various other films. Like you don't see that as often. Nowadays, as you did back then. That's why it was kind of... 
like John Candy, he's in the film a decent amount because of playing the two characters, but at the same time, it still feels like he doesn't have a lot to do or say, just other than being dragged and stuff. Just so I do wish a little bit more could have been done with number two pot secure. I wish a little bit more couldn't have been done with uh, John Candy. But yeah, the film is still, I mean, this went by a pretty fast pace, and I, like I said, I still enjoy the film. There's a little nitpicks and issues here and there, but yeah, I still like it. I, still, I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be. Like I said, I still think it's a pretty... Unique original film that it has a couple chuckles, couple laughs, fun song at the end, good cast, and I mean, come on, you look at the other actor's resume, like Chevy Chase, I'm sorry, this is not as bad as Teddy Shat 2. It's not as bad as, you know, Hot Tub Time Machine 2, which you were in. Like Dan, like for Dan Aykroyd, this is not nearly as bad as Exit to Eden or Blues Brothers 2000 or North. But yeah, you got an audio interview with Dan Aykroyd and it's, let's see, how long is it? It's 15 minutes. Oh. Audio interview with Chevy Chase, which is eight minutes. Bertilla, Bertilla DeMoss, seven minutes. But this is an on camera interview. Production designer William Sandal. Causing designer Deborah Landis. Music producer Christopher Brooks. Trailer, TV spots, publicity gallery. And production gallery. And the look quick on the production gallery. Pretty much like still photos. Yeah, that poster I always did enjoy and like. Chevy, Dan, John, Demi Moore, the four of them. All they wanted was a little getaway. All they got was nothing but trouble. I love the artwork on the bottom too with like the big buzzard. It's not in the movie. The big pile of bones. The landfill fill of cars. It just, again, traced that weird vibe of the film that it does showcase. I, like, the film, like, completely bomb, like, even to the point, like, hey, maybe people will be curious about it. People would give it a shot, give it a look. No, I mean, it made nothing. Like, either people didn't know it was coming out. People didn't know that the movie even existed. To even be given a chance, it seemed. But the, the bad word of mouth didn't help either. But yeah. It is what it is. I don't know if, if I play the audio. Of, anyway, it is what it is. Thanks for watching. Take care. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.